against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. And then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dave Robbins with End Time Ministries, and I do thank you for joining me on Tuesday's edition of End of the Age. Now, we talk about, uh, here at End Time Ministries, we specialize in the prophecies of the Bible. It's what we're focused on here, and we're called by God to do that. And obviously, we folk, we, I dealt last week on a lot of the prophecies concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ, and then prophecies that centered around the second coming of Jesus Christ. But I'm going to focus mainly today on the second coming of Jesus Christ and the, the Lord gives us many different timelines in Scripture. Uh, there's a huge timeline from Ezekiel and, and Joel. It starts all the way back there, all the way through Revelation chapter 22. And it's focusing on one event, and that's the second coming of Jesus Christ. But there are two main events that, well, there's uh, two main topics that we're looking for, and that's the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> Some folks have taught that the rapture occurs and then there's a seven year period between that and the second coming of Jesus Christ. But on today's program, and I'll, I'll have to get scooting here or, uh, to get it all in, but on today's program, I'm going to show you that the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ are the same event. They both happen at the same time. So let's go down through here and see if I can't convince you what the scripture says about the rapture and the second coming being the exact same event. It's a simultaneous event. The rapture doesn't happen and then there's a seven year period, then the second coming. It's a simultaneous event that both of them happen just at the very end of the great tribulation. So let's talk about it. The second coming of Jesus will occur at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, which is the last trumpet. The second coming is foretold many times throughout the Bible. And in Acts chapter 1, let's look at this uh, account. Jesus was getting ready to ascend into heaven. He had just been crucified. He spent three days and nights in the grave, and then he rose from the dead. Well, for 40 days after that, he showed himself alive by appearing to many people at different times. At one time, he appeared to a crowd of 500 people. Well, of course, this provided infallible proof that he had indeed risen from the dead. After these 40 days, Jesus led his disciples to the Mount of Olives to give them his final instructions before leaving the earth. He told them to go back to Jerusalem and stay there until they were, had, had been endued with power from on high. Well, many were there from Galilee, which was about 100 miles away, so they could have really gone home. But he wanted them to go to Jerusalem because while they were there, he was going to empower them and baptize them with the Holy Ghost. That was the power they were going to receive. He told them that they needed to go, um, they needed the Holy Ghost to have power to fulfill his commission. So he said, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Well, after giving his final instructions, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Then he suddenly ascended into heaven right before their very eyes. The Bible says, a cloud received him out of their sight. While the disciples stood staring up into the sky, two men in white apparel immediately appeared by them. Acts 1, 9 through 11 says that these messengers said unto them, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. This was the promise that was given that Jesus would return to the earth 
And the disciples, however, they really had no idea it would take place 2,000 years uh, from when they were promised. The promise was to be fulfilled. So though it still has really not yet happened, obviously, it's just, we're just ahead of that now, and it has already been close to 2,000 years since it was given, it will happen. We know that because of all the prophecies uh, that we've seen fulfilled up to this point. It's got to happen. And so the promise of the Lord's return is firm. We know it's going to happen. He will come again. It's the second coming of Jesus Christ. But it's imperative that we understand as we study the second coming that it will not be like the first coming. Jesus knew as the time for his return drew closer that people would claim to be Messiah and, and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So this is, in fact, really a frequently occurrence nowadays, if you think about it. Uh, people have seen the Messiah here and, oh, there's, you know, we've seen his vision in the clouds and the people will all rush over there. But really to keep us from being deceived by these false claims, we've been given specific instructions about what the second coming will actually be like. And that's what I'm going to spend my time on today. This time, it's not, it's not going to be like a baby's, a baby's not going to be born in a stable and found lying in a manger. Jesus will not slip in through the back door and show up mysteriously. Matthew 24, 23 through 26 states, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that it, if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect, or the church on the earth at that time. Behold, I have told you before, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. Well, why were we not? This, this, Matthew 24 is written to us, people in the generation that would see the second coming of Jesus Christ. Why are we not to believe it? Because Matthew 24, 27 says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus instructed them not to pay attention to those who say the Messiah is here or over here or he showed up in this secret chamber. Many believe that the Muslim Messiah is coming and is called the 12th Imam or the Mahdi. Jesus instructs, us, uh, instructs for us not to pay attention to those claims like these because they're false according to Scripture. When Jesus returns... There will be lightning flashes from the east to the west. He will come in the clouds of heaven and it will be a very dramatic event. He will show up in the skies of heaven for every eye will see him. Matthew 24, 29 through 31 states, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now what I want everybody to recognize is that as we're talking about the second coming, we're also talking about the rapture. The events that transpire during the occurrence called the rapture that we would refer to as the rapture or the catching away of the saints, it's the same event as the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you've, you've already seen it here, Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 through 31. We're talking about the second coming and then he talks about the rapture and then we proceed on. So it's the same event. And you'll see that over and over and over as we go throughout uh, the rest of the lesson. So when Jesus returns, every eye will see him. It's going to be this great dramatic event. He's not going to come as a child in a manger. He's going to split the clouds wide open. And here he is. The whole world will behold him. And when Jesus, um, so, and, um, so, and whenever, when he comes back, every eye is going to see him and he's going to send his angels to gather his elect or the elect in the New Testament is the church. In the Old Testament, the elect was um, the Israelites. In the, once you come into the New Testament, 
The elect is referring to the church at that time. And so in Matthew 24, verse 40, it says this about the second coming again. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, the others left. Imagine what it would be like to be really working alongside someone, riding beside or talking to someone who suddenly disappears. Some, that person was a, was a saved individual and maybe perhaps you hadn't obeyed the gospel yet and somebody just disappears. Imagine, that's what the Bible says it's going to be like. The people in these verses are depicted as participating in activities that were common for that time or that they were working. They were just, uh, one was in the field, one was eating dinner. They were common for that time and place. But it is used as an example to explain that people really in our day, 2,000 years later, remember the Olivet Discourse is given to us. The, he's answering the question, what's it going to be like at the time of your second coming? And um, that people will be living really out their daily lives, doing normal things when Jesus returns. Luke 17 says, two will be in the bed. One will be taken, the other left. Maybe a, a wife is taken and the husband is left. Or on, on the flip side, the husband's taken and the wife is left. The husband had, had or the wife had been a church going member. They were born again. They were saved. And perhaps the mate didn't go and hadn't obeyed the gospel. The Bible says one's going to be taken, the other's going to be left. It's going to be a marvelous moment for those who are taken, but it's going to be unbelievably frightening for those who are left standing, especially those who have been told about the, who have been told about, uh, but had really not heeded the gospel or obeyed the gospel. You don't want to find yourself in that situation. If you don't know what the gospel is, call in time. Uh, email uh, dnorvell at endtime.com, drobbins at endtime.com. We'll help you. We'll explain the gospel to you because you don't want, we don't want to be, you'd, you would never want to be one of the ones that would be left. And the Bible specifically says that there will be some taken and others will be left. So I know that uh, there are people that will teach, hey, everybody's going to go. That's not what the Bible says. There is a specific way that you have to get ready. Obey the gospel. Obey the plan of salvation called being born again. We can help you do that. We can explain that to you. We've got uh, brochures. What do you mean born again? It's on our website. Go to the, it's right on a homepage, endtime.com. What do you mean born again? You need to absorb that information and make sure that you obey the gospel so you're not one of the ones that's left behind. You don't want it. That's, that would be a, a travesty. The worst travesty. So the Apostle Paul teaches about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Now remember, I'm doing the second coming and the rapture. Same event. You're going to see that over and over. It talks about these two events combined together. It's the same thing. In Thessalonians 4.13, uh, it states, this is the Apostle Paul, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, or those the saints that have died um, before us, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The Bible also, also often refers to people who are saved and then died as being asleep because for believers, death was considered temporary. So Paul continues and he states, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus or who have been born again, uh, or, or are dead in Jesus, will God, God's going to bring with him. So Paul was saying that those who believe Jesus died and rose again, who die in Jesus and, or have the, the, who have obeyed the gospel and have the spirit of Jesus, um, he's gonna, he, they'll be brought forth from the grave like Jesus was. Jesus was risen from the grave. The Bible says, if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then you'll be caught up to meet him in the air at that time. Then Paul continues in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 16. For this we say unto you, by the, world of, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. The trump of God there is the last trump. You can see it all throughout 
the last trump, the seventh trump, it's the same thing. There's not two last trumps. There's not two final trumps. There's only one last trump, and it's the seventh trump. So when the Bible says that the rapture occurs at the last trump, it's referring to the seventh trumpet. You want to understand what happens at the seventh trumpet? It's at the very end of Revelation chapter 11. The seventh trumpet. It's the last trump. The trump of God. And the second coming of Jesus is, like I said before, it's going to be a very, very dramatic event. Verse 16 continues and it says, And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, saints that are still here on the earth, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So at the rapture, at the time of the second coming, we're going to go up to meet the Lord in the air. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then the Christians who are alive on the earth at the time of the second coming, once the dead in Christ have risen, they will rise together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so a lot of people get confused here because they say, well, hold on a minute. At the rapture, we're going up to meet the Lord. But the Bible says at the time of the second coming that the Lord's going to plant his feet on the Mount of Olives and the saints will come with him. So right there, Dave, it proves that it's two separate events. Well, let me continue on because I'm going to explain to you that it's one simultaneous event. He collects, uh, he, the Lord comes back, split the clouds wide open, and, gather, and sends his angels to gather his elect. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky, and we go straight with him to fight at uh, the Battle of Armageddon on behalf of Israel. So it's one simultaneous event. It's not one event, and then there's a seven-year period, and then the second coming occurs. It's one simultaneous event. He comes, gathers his saints. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky, and we go straight with him to fight on behalf of Israel at the Battle of Armageddon, that's when he plants his feet on the Mount of Olives. So I'll see if I can get to all this and explain that in great detail before we get done, because that's what the Bible teaches. And uh, I, I want to make sure you get it before the end of the program here. So Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54, Behold, I show you a mystery or a secret. We shall not all sleep. Not all people are going to die. People who serve Jesus will be alive when Jesus returns. And then Paul continues, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. There it is again, the last trump, the seventh trump, same exact thing. Many teach that those who serve the Lord will simply disappear at the last trump. It's going to happen in a twinkling of an eye. But the Bible doesn't say that. It says we will be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, which means the dead will be given mortal, um, the dead will be given um, immortal bodies, the inability to die. And we that are alive and remain shall be changed in a moment and twinkling of an eye. We're not going to be zipped out of here. We're going to be changed in the moment and twinkling of an eye. For this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. The Latin word morto means the ability to die or to die. So to be mortal means the to be able to die. So this mortal body, the, the, the body we have now, which can die, will put on immortality, a new body that has no ability to die. It can't die. The Bible says, and we're going to be with the Lord from, from then on. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And then verse 54 says, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death swallowed up in victory. When the last trumpet sounds, the bodies of those still alive will be changed in a moment from mortal to immortal. Then we are caught up. Our feet will leave the ground just like Jesus' feet left the ground. And those dead in Christ will rise. Then those who are alive will go together with the dead to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 then says, Death is swallowed up in victory. And in 55 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It's going to be a wonderful, awesome day for those who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Revelation uh, then gives many accounts. The book of Revelation gives many accounts of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation 
really is a book of the revealing of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.1 says the revelation of Jesus Christ or the revealing of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto John or unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So the word translated revelation is the word apocalypsis, which means to reveal. So the entire 22 chapters of the book of Revelation is devoted really to dramatizing and telling the story of how the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to happen. And there are accounts of the rapture in that book. Now think about that. So the second coming is the, really the crowning moment of all of human history. Of course, the first coming was a, a dramatic event. If you really understood what happened there, the God of the universe, the God of, of every, all space, all time, robed himself in flesh and died for us. It was, it was a very um, critical point in human history. Because of that, we have an opportunity to be saved. But the second coming is the crowning moment, really, of all human history. Jesus Christ will return to the earth to put down the thrones of men and establish the long-promised kingdom of God. Revelation tells several accounts of Christ's second coming from really different angles. One account is found in Revelation chapter 6. The, the accounts are found, if you want to look them up, Revelation chapter 6, chapter 11, chapter 14, and then all the way over in chapter 19. So you have four separate accounts of the second coming of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. It's told four different times. And so you can look that up and, and, uh, and make sure I know what I'm talking about. It is the sixth, the Revelation 6 is the sixth seal account of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 through 13 says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, uh, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. There are a total of seven seals. You know the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials in the book of Revelation. And the sixth seal reveals Jesus' com uh, second coming as happening with a great earthquake. The sun turning black, the moon become as blood, and the stars fell from heaven. You've seen that other times in Scripture. Ma Matthew chapter 24 is another one. It's the same event. The rapture and the second coming, the exact same event. These, these um, characteristics happen in e each and every event. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 through 16 says, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks and of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Remember that term, the wrath of the lamb. It happens all throughout in all four accounts. You hear about the wrath, the wrath, the wrath. I've had people say, well, hold on a minute. The rapture is a message of hope but the second coming is a message of judgment or the wrath of God. Well, the second coming is really going to be a message of both. For those who are saved, the second coming is going to be, it's, it's our eternal hope. We're going to be with Him. But yet for those who are left behind, remember the ones taken, the others left behind? That's where the judgment and the wrath of the Lamb is going to come in. So you have to understand, you have to marry all this together. When you're studying a topic in Scripture, you have to look at all of the Scriptures. You can't pull one or two. Look at all of the Scriptures, gather them all together to see the context of really what happens. And it will really help you in the understanding concerning the rapture and the second coming. It's all the same exact event. One simultaneous event. So... Though it will be, it's really going to be a wonderful time for God's people who are caught up in the air to meet Him. Like I said, it's going to be a terrible time for those who chose to live in rebellion and refuse to live their lives to God or believe the gospel and obey the gospel. 
We often emphasize the mercy and the love of God, but many fail to preach about God's judgment and his wrath that's coming. But those who reject Christ will receive the wrath of God. Revelation chapter 6, verse 17 says, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? People are going to run and hide in the rocks and the mountains and cry for them to fall on them and hide them from the wrath of God. And so the seventh trumpet account of the second coming is found in Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. Now remember, it's found over there in Revelation chapter 6. You have the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then you jump over to Revelation chapter 11 and you've got a second account of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Here we are, Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, and it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It will be the transition from human government to the, and the kingdoms of this world to the promised kingdom of God that's going to be established. And from that point on, God will reign forever and ever. He's going to reign here on earth for a thousand years but he's going to have control from here on. Revelation eleven sixteen, then says, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. So I know I'm coming up to a break here. And for those of you that are watching or listening on the radio and your radio station just covers the first 30 minutes. I'm going to try to get through the entire program today proving to you that the rapture and the second coming are one simultaneous event. The Lord collects his church. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky and we go straight with uh, the Lord on white horses to fight at the battle of Armageddon on behalf of Israel. We'll talk about it when I get back. From here to Armageddon, a new exciting eight lesson series to share with your friends and family. Order yours right away. Answering many questions like, how far are we from the Battle of Armageddon? What will happen between now and then? Where are we on the timeline? Your questions answered in this exciting eight lesson series from here to Armageddon. Go to endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-END-TIME, 1-800-363-8463. Order yours right away. Today I have some exciting news to share with you. You can now become a magazine subscriber for life. You will receive first class benefits that will include a lifetime membership to End Time Magazine, as well as an unlimited access to the digital version of the magazine. You will also receive 20% off of all future orders at endtime.com, well at least till the rapture happens. Never worry about missing one important issue or forgetting to renew. You can rest assured when something happens in the news pertaining to Bible prophecy, you will be informed with the most recent cutting edge material available. End Time Magazine has been the forefront of End Time Ministries since the beginning. And we would love to join with you in this first ever opportunity of becoming a magazine subscriber for life. Join today by calling 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463 or go to endtime.com. If your station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com and click the watch button to continue today's broadcast. You can also finish up later by clicking the archives button. Well, isn't this, isn't the second coming of Jesus Christ going to be an awesome, wonderful, dramatic event. If you're born again and that trumpet sounds, your feet leave the ground, that you were a smashing, smashing success in this life. And you know, really around here, we have the question, uh, we have the conversation all the time. Uh, do you believe in a pre-trib rapture, a post-trib rapture? And most people would agree that I talk to that the second coming of Jesus Christ happens at the very end of the final seven years at the seventh trumpet. And um, that's that it's at the it's a post trib event, the second coming. But if I can convince you, if I can show you in scripture that the rapture and the second coming is the same event, 
then the pre-post-trib conversation goes out the window because we know that the second coming, most people would agree that the second coming happens after the tribulation period. And so once you understand that the rapture and the second coming are, the, are one simultaneous event, you understand the, the simultaneous um, harvest in Matthew 13, the, simultaneous, the second simultaneous harvest, which is the same event as Matthew 13, but it's told a second time in, Matthew, or in uh, Revelation 14, where the angels go in with the sickles and reap the harvest of the earth and the vine of the earth. It's the same account told in Matthew chapter 13. And it's the rapture of the church. So you have to understand that the rapture, second coming, the exact same, one simultaneous event. So the account of the second coming given in Revelation chapter 11 at the seventh trump, this event is also referred to in Daniel 7, 9. It says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit. Daniel saw the casting down of the thrones of human government and God sitting on his throne. And it's the realization of the prayer many have prayed. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. And so that's what's going to happen at the, at the seventh trump. Also chapter 6, chapter 14, and chapter 19 in the book of Revelation. Revelation 11, 11 18 then says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. There it again. The wrath is in Revelation 6. Then right over here in Revelation 11, and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give a reward unto thy servants, the prophets and to the saints. You say, well, hold on a minute. I thought the Lord giving the reward to the prophets and the saints happened seven years before this when the rapture is supposed to have occurred. But the Bible says right here in uh, Revelation chapter 11 that it happens at the seventh trump or the last trump. That's exactly what we're trying to say. The rapture and the second coming, right here, Revelation chapter 11, at the last trump, it all happens at the same time. It's one simultaneous event. And then the Bible says, And them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So there's going to be a time of rapture and reward for the saints, but there's going to be a time of judgment at the very same time, right there at the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's not seven years before it all, it's one simultaneous event. The Bible, and so what's going to happen? Well, their anger, the ones that are left, the Bible, the, the, you can just, uh, let's just kind of summarize it, see what happens. Their anger is going to cause the nations to invade Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. And their attempt to destroy Israel will make God angry at their rebellion. And though it will be a time of God's great wrath, it's also going to be a time that the prophets and the saints are given their rewards. Verse 19 says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there, this is, I'm in Revelation 11 still. Uh, verse 19, And there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament. And there were lightnings, voices, thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. So lightnings, voices, thundering, earthquake, and hail are all mentioned in the prophecy of the sixth seal as well. So you've got them at the sixth seal, and then you've got them again here at the seventh trumpet. So both Revelation and Matthew, let's look at another account of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I talked to it a little bit about the parable, the wheat and the tares. Both Revelation and Matthew give accounts of the two simultaneous harvest. Not two separate harvest, but two simultaneous harvest. They happen at the same time. In Matthew 13, Jesus told the parable of the wheat and the tares. He said, There was a certain man who owned a field, and his servants had sown seed in the field. When the seed come up, they noticed that there were tares mingle, or weeds uh, mingled with the seed. And the servants uh, asked their master if the seed they had sown was bad seed. Did you buy it at a good store or a bad store? because they, they could not understand why they would have tares in among the wheat that they had planted. Well, the master replied that an enemy had sown the tares into their wheat harvest. Jesus explained the parable in Matthew 13, 37 through 39, and he said, he answered and said unto them, uh, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. 
The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world or the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So it's an account of the second coming of Jesus Christ and the rapture, simultaneous event. The sower that sows the seed of the word of God is Jesus, the son of man. The field is the world where Jesus sows his word. The good seed that comes up as the wheat are those who will be saved. The tares are those who reject the gospel and they, are the, they will be lost, the children of the wicked one. The enemy who sows the tares is the devil and the harvest is the end of the age at the second coming of Jesus Christ. The reapers, according to Jesus, are the angels. So what will happen to the wheat and the tares? Matthew 13, 40 explains. It says, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this age. The servants asked the master if they should separate the wheat from the tares. But the master told them, no, because that if you go in and tear up the tares first, that they would uproot the wheat while trying to uproot the tares if you did them at the same time. But he commanded them that they should wait until the harvest, until the time of the harvest. Then the wheat can be gathered and put into the barn while the tares are separated out and burned. Jesus said uh, that just as the tares will be gathered, the wicked ones will be put into the judgment at the end of this age. So the, at, the, at the very same time, there's going to be a time of hope and a time of reward for the saved individuals. But at the exact same time, there's going to be a time of judgment and the wrath of God. Matthew 13, 41 says, The Son of Man shall send forth His angels. This is an account of the rapture at the very same time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they shall gather out, his, out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now this would be at the end for those who, this would be the end, or uh, will be the end, I should say, for those who reject the gospel. But Matthew 13, 43 says, Then shall the righteous shine forth, and the Son in the kingdom of the Father. When Jesus returns, those who have believed the gospel and whom he has made righteous are going to shine forth and be a participant in the kingdom of the Father. Jesus continued and said, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Revelation 14, uh, 14 through 20 then gives the second account of the simultaneous harvest. It gives another, um, kind of another, it's told in another way. Rather than wheat and tares, now we're going to look at the vine and the harvest of the earth. So um, the, the first harvest is found in verses 14 through 16. And it's, it says this, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud... One sat like unto the Son of Man. This is the same thing as Matthew 13, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So he's got a sickle. He's going to reap a harvest. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, and, and said, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. The Son of Man is Jesus. The harvest of the earth is the wheat. And this is the rapture when the saints are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Revelation 14, 17 through 18 shows the second harvest. And it says, And another angel come out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. So he's going to reap as well. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire and cried out with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in the sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. The vine of the earth refers to the tares in the two harvest prophecy way back in Matthew 13. Revelation 14, 19 through 20 then continues on to say, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now here we are. Remember, the wrath of God, Revelation chapter 6, the wrath of God, Revelation chapter 11, 
And then here we are back talking about the wrath of God again at the simultaneous harvest of the, the angels that had the sickles in, for, in Revelation 14 now. Because it's the same account, but told three different ways up to this point. We're going to see it again in Revelation 19. It says the great wine press of the wrath of God. Remember that term, the wine press of the wrath of God. That's mentioned again all the way over in Revelation 19 because the, 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 the depiction of this is told again a fourth time in the book of Revelation. It goes on to say, And the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even under the horse bridles, by the space of 1,600 furlongs. So once the rapture takes place, the people of the earth or the armies of the earth will be ushered into the wine press or the wrath of God and will be trodden without the city. This is referring to the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon will begin in the plain of Megiddo in the northern parts of Israel. The Israeli army obviously is going to be driven back down the Jordan Valley and then it's going to culminate just outside the city of Jerusalem in the Kidron Valley in between the, um, the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives, which is known as the Valley of Slaughter or the Kidron Valley or the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The distance from Megiddo to Jerusalem is roughly 160 miles if you come down the Jordan Valley. And you notice that the passage says the blood will flow by the space of 1,600 furlongs. 600 furlongs is about 160 miles. Jesus Christ will come back to the earth at the battle of Armageddon. So here you have in Revelation 14, a depiction of the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ being the exact same event again. It's told many times throughout the Bible, but in Revelation 14, it's told again. The wrath of God, it, we're gonna look, and if you look in Revelation 16, I don't know if I'm gonna, I'm not gonna cover that today, but Revelation 16 is the vials of the wrath of God. And then it talks about in verse 16, about the, then he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So you have it again, the wrath of God, the battle of Armageddon. So, uh, well, I, I guess I'm coming up on a break here, but uh, I, I just want to make sure you understand before the end of the program today, that the rapture and the second coming, the exact same one simultaneous event. It's told many times throughout scripture and I just wanted to make sure, do a Bible study today to make sure that you understood um, the, the, the truth taught in the Word of God. The rapture, the second coming, one simultaneous event. Join End Time Prophecy students in Jerusalem. Jerusalem Prophecy College. Study from the convenience of your own home through our online learning courses. Taught by Dr. Irvin Baxter. Learn about the prophecies of the Bible that will soon come to pass. Take advantage of this opportunity to learn valuable information. Save thousands of dollars by attending JPC online. Attend for only $50 per semester. Jerusalem Prophecy College offers five semesters. These courses include Understanding the End Time, Theology and End Time Christianity, Daniel Commentaries, and Revelation Commentaries 1 and 2. Each 16-week semester can be completed at your own pace. Enrollment ends May 5th. So enroll today. Learn more about the times we are living in and how you can be prepared. Be sure to sign up right away at JerusalemProphecyCollege.com. So there you have it, folks. You have the, a, a story of the second coming of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 11, Revelation chapter 14, and then the most dramatic account of the second coming of Jesus Christ is found in Revelation chapter 19, verse 6 through 20. Verse 6, through six and 7 says, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. So 
some people would say, hey, re the, the rapture occurred in Revelation 4.1. But you've got the marriage supper clear over here in Revelation 19. So if you, if you try to look at it like that, you'll get confused studying the book of Revelation. You've got to understand there are four different accounts of the second coming of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation and accounts of the rapture along the way. It's a simultaneous event. So here you have the marriage supper of the Lamb. The bride hath made herself ready. The church is referred to throughout Scripture as the bride of Christ. The Bible teaches when Jesus returns that we will be caught up to meet Him in the air and our marriage will be consummated. We will be joined and we will, for, we will be um, forever together with the Lord. When He comes to establish His kingdom to rule as the King of kings, the bride, His wife, the church, will rule with Him. The Bible says we will rule and reign with Him as kings and priests. Revelation 5.10 says we will reign with Him as kings and priests on the earth. Then in Revelation 19, remember we're giving the most dramatic account of the second coming. Revelation 19.8 says, And to her, the, the bride, the church, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The church, the bride, will be arrayed in the righteousness that Jesus imputes to us through His cleansing blood. That's why you must be born again. That's when the blood is applied to your life. His forgiveness of all of our transgressions will make us ready to be His bride. Revelation 19.9 then says, And He saith unto me, Right, blessed, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. We are being called or the rapture is taking place, but we will also be chosen to be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is the will of God that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. It is necessary to respond to the call of God in your life, to, in my life as well, both of us, to be a part of the bride of Christ. Then in Revelation 19, 11, John says, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. The heavens will open and Jesus in his splendor, glory, in his resplendent glory, will be riding a white horse. And he is called faithful and true, Jesus Christ. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. Jesus will judge iniquity and make war against those who have lived in rebellion and have rejected his lordship as the creator of all things. Revelation 19, 12 says, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his heads were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Jesus is faithful and true. He's coming to judge, and he's coming to make war against the ungodly at Armageddon. Remember the wine press. We're fixing to talk about that. Revelation 19, 13 then says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Why is his name called the Word of God? Remember back in John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then in John 1, uh, John 1 14, it continues saying, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And, he beheld his, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word of God was God, manifest in the flesh. The Word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. How? Jesus. Jesus dwelt among us. When Jesus returns, His name will be the Word of God. Revelation 19, 14 then says, And the armies which were in heaven followed Him upon white horses, clothed in fine linens, white and clean. This is referring to the church who has been caught up to meet Him in the air. We will come with him to the Mount of Olives, the Battle of Armageddon, and be with him as he defeats the armies of the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon. We will crown him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Remember, I said the rapture and the second coming, one simultaneous event. The Lord comes back, sends his angels with the sound of a trump to gather the church. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky early in Revelation 19. And then we go straight with him on behalf of Israel to fight at the Battle of Armageddon. It's told in great detail right here in Revelation chapter 19. Then Revelation 19, 15 continues and says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, 
that with it he should smite the nations. Many people don't want to really acknowledge it, but God is angry at the nations. He's angry at the evil to which people have really given themselves to. People pretty much, not everybody, but a lot of people just do whatever they want. They live however they want and it's okay to tell a lie if I, uh, if I want to, uh, do different things. People have just given themselves over to evil and God is not happy with that. You can't live however you want to and expect to be with him through eternity. That's not how it works. If you get in a good Bible study and understand really what's going on here, the Bible is our roadmap on how to get to heaven and you've got to live a certain way to make it. Not everybody's going to make it. And you can't live your life however you want and then say, oh, I, I just want to be with the Lord for eternity. That's not how it works. The Bible says, present your body a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. That, it's just, that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to be born again and live as a Christian if you want to make it. That's according to the scripture. Then when the Lord returns, he will smite the nations. He's unhappy with them. And the Bible says, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He will tolerate no dissent because man's way has brought only really war, heartache, and disease. Think about it. Revelation 19, 15 concludes by saying, and he, here it is again, and he treadeth the winepress. We saw it back in chapter 14. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. This same winepress wine is referred to as the wrath of God in Revelation 6, 11, 14, and now here in chapter 19, four different times in the book of Revelation. Revelation 19, 16 then says, And he, or Jesus Christ, hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he will rule the nations with the rod of iron. Then Revelation 19, 17 through 18. I'm just walking you down through Revelation chapter 19. It says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves. Now remember, we're at the Battle of Armageddon here. The Lord's come back, planted his feet on the Mount of Olives, and he has slayed those armies. The Bible says that the Lord will say, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all the men, both free and bond, small and great. So here we are. We're given a glimpse of what God thinks about what's going on in our world right now. He's not happy with it. These will be world government armies that come down against Israel to battle and the Lord's going to destroy them when he comes back. That's one of the reasons we don't want the United States to ever be part of this world government army. And right now we see that there are wars and rumors of wars. Men and, men and women are killing one another. It's crazy. But the ultimate travesty, let's be honest, the ultimate travesty will be when the nations of the world under the UN banner go against Israel to try to bring Israel under subjection to the world government system. This is going to make God angry. And in his anger, God's going to cause the birds, to, the birds and the, 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 the beast of the field to come to gather together to eat the flesh of the kings, captains, and mighty men, the horses and their riders, of the free and the uh, bond men and the great and the small men. It's going to be a, a, a horrible sight. And then in Revelation 19, 19, John said, and I saw the beast. Well, this is referring to the Antichrist, the one world leader. John said, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth who support the beast and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. I, I can't fathom this, but they're going to make war against Jesus Christ and against his army, the immortal church. And of course, we know that the rest of the chapter lets us know that the beast is going to be taken with him, the false prophet, and they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. And so it's going, to be, it's going to be bad. The Bible says that, they wrought, that, that they're going to take him, his, him and his religious partner that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These both, the Antichrist and the false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. 
when Jesus returns, he's going to cast these two principal leaders, the Antichrist and the false prophet, into the lake of fire. Then Revelation 21 through 3, go back up into the next chapter, and it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a short season." So the reason we really have so many problems in our world today is because the people of the world are deceived. The nations are deceived. But when Satan is bound for that thousand years, it's not going to be able to deceive anybody anymore. It's going to be bound for 1,000 years. Then the Bible says, Revelation 24, uh, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And unto them I saw the souls that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus Christ and for the word of God, and had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark in their foreheads or in their right hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for that thousand years. And this is re specifically referring to those who were killed because they resisted the mark of the beast, which will be used in the near future to obviously try to force conformity to the one world government. And then the Bible says, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. So who is verse 4 referring to? The Bible says, this is the first resurrection. Well, you say, well, hold on a minute. The first resurrection, those, those that were, did not receive the mark of the beast, did not take his mark in a right hand or in a forehead. And when they were resurrected, that that's the first resurrection. And it happens after the tribulation period, that's exactly what I'm saying, folks. The rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ, one simultaneous event. The Lord comes back in the clouds, gathers His church at the last trump. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky, and we go straight with Him to fight at the battle of Armageddon. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. This is very key. The Bible says, Behold, I come as a thief. And then in the very next verse, it says, And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. The rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ is the exact same event. And it happens at the end of Daniel's 70th week, after the tribulation period. The Lord will come back, gather his saints. We have a marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky, Revelation 19, and other places. And we go straight with him to fight on behalf of Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. End of the Age is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom. <laughs>